go with the of basically our North American keynote uh, accident investigation keynote section today. And our Alentian keynotes presents a very unique opportunity that may not happen very often. We have two indisputable world leaders in accident investigation and safety advancement with us today on the stage at the same time, which is remarkable and I'm very excited about. We have the Honorable Robert Sumwalt, NTSB Vice Chair and Acting Chairman, and we have Kathy Fox, the Chair of the Transportation Safety Board Canada. In terms of accident investigation, I don't think it gets any better than that. I'm I know it doesn't get any better than that. Now, we all know that accident investigations are critical to the successful prevention of future accidents. And the air safety organization representatives that investigate accidents on behalf of ALPA receive specialized training and recurrent training to ensure preparedness should they need to be called into action. I myself have personally participated in one of the courses, the first accident investigation course, and I can tell you from experience that there is a lot, a lot to an accident investigation. It was, it was truly, truly eye-opening and gave me a renewed respect for folks that have to walk into a situation like that. Now, the leaders we have today have advanced the science of accident investigation that truly benefits us all. Without their efforts to improve aviation safety through the work that they do, we would not have the level of aviation safety that currently exists. But there's much more to do, as we all know. Work continues. But please allow me to take a moment to once again introduce Captain Steve Jangelis, the Alpha Air Safety A uh, Organization's Aviation Safety Chair. You've seen him several times now. Steve has been involved in the ASO for many years, and he became Aviation Safety Chair just this past January. In his role, he oversees many important areas that we focus on, including our accident investigation related efforts. In fact, Steve and I just met briefly and had a discussion regarding accident investigation. So I can think of no better person to facilitate the discussion that is about to unfold before your eyes right now. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you and our special guests. And thank you once again to both Kathy Fox and Robert Sumwalt for coming here. Good afternoon and thank you, Joe. Thanks for the great introduction. Go ahead, folks, please continue with your lunch. We're gonna go ahead and get started with this great panel. This afternoon, we have the privilege of having the chairs of both the U.S. and Canadian Accident Investigation Boards. The acting chairman and recently nominated to serve as the 14th chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, the Honorable Robert Sumwalt, and Ms. Kathy Fox, chair of the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. It is my pleasure to moderate this lunchtime discussion with these two distinguished panelists. You'll find their extensive bios in the Safety Forum app. Point of personal privilege, this is a great pleasure for me also for my family on both sides of the border, my mother being Canadian, my father being from the U.S. This is a special moment for me. I have, I have feet on both sides of the border, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very transparent border uh, family with family located on both sides. Over the decades, ALP has developed and fostered outstanding working relationships with both the NTSB and the TSB. ALP has participated in numerous acts investigations as a party during NTSB investigations and observers to TSB investigations. Our safety record on both sides of the border speaks volumes. Aviation is the safest mode of transportation. This safe environment is also a testament to the quality of the investigations these two agencies complete and to the actions recommended after accident and incident investigations. Having both of you here gives us a great opportunity to hear firsthand your thoughts on some very relevant topics. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll discuss some tough issues, including discussing image recorders on the flight deck, we'll discuss social media and investigations, and how investigative agencies participate in proactive safety programs and investigate organizations with SMS. I'll start the discussion, but we, all want, we want this also to be interactive. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up to one of the microphones towards the end of our discussion and ask your question or send a question through the app and the address is located on the little cards located on your table. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. As I mentioned earlier, image recorders. 
it's a subject that's been coming up recently. It's, it's new technology that we have that uh, uh, is, has been discussed uh, by uh, both agencies and also by uh, some various uh, industry stakeholders. Kathy, I wanted to ask you a question. The, the conversation regarding image recorders has continued over the last decade. And most recently, we saw ICAO put, a, put forward a state letter on image recorders. What do you see as the pros and cons of the installations of these image recorders? Well, thank you, Stephen. And, and uh, we really appreciate the invitation from ALPA to come and speak here today. Uh, we agree on a lot of things, but I, I understand this is a sensitive issue for, for flight crews. And uh, we may not always see it eye to eye, so it's good to have a candid conversation. The, the TSB believes that image recorders can substantially benefit uh, accident investigators uh, during the conduct of an investigation, uh, particularly if the crew is not alive to, to recount what was happening. They can complement the, uh, the data that we get from cockpit voice recorders and from flight data recorders. We know that CVRs aren't perfect. Uh, there can be problems with the quality of the recording. There can be ambiguities in the communications uh, amongst the flight crew. Uh, so the ability to see what was going on as well as hear the discussion to see um, alarms, uh, instrument indications, we think can really uh, help the, the TSB to identify not only what happened but why it happened. And of course, we made a, two recommend well, an a recommendation specific to image recorders in the aftermath of the Swiss Air 111 accident. Uh, at Peggy's Cove, uh, where we recommended that regulatory authorities harmonize requirements for the introduction of, of image recorders. Robert, your thoughts? Pros, cons, image recorders? I'd like to take a pass on that question. You'd like to? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Phone a friend. No, let me, um, uh, it's, it's great to be back. It's great to be back in this room. And uh, Joe said that the accident investigation authorities are are largely responsible for the improved uh, safety record. And, uh, and I do think that uh, to some extent that's true. We, we learn from, from accidents to improve transportation safety. But I think the real credit goes to the professionals that are out on the front line each and every day. And uh, so my hat's off to you and, uh, and to, uh, to ALPA. ALPA has, uh, has basically, as you know, the slogan of ALPA is schedule with safety. And it's always been something on the forefront, and you're actively out there on the front line. So I want to I want to thank you and your colleagues for all the work you've done. Um, you know, I was an ALPA member for 24 years. I was an ALPA air safety rep for 17 of those years. I was the U.S. Air. I was the ALPA rep to the NTSB's longest investigation in history, uh, U.S. Air 427 uh, in in Pittsburgh. And you'll recall there that there was a case where uh, the studies, kinematic studies, showed that the rudder went hard over. Either the, either, and, and basically the rudder went there for one of two reasons. Either the airplane put it there or the pilots put it there. We would have, and I was on the human performance group, we would have loved to have known what was going on in that cockpit. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if, you had, if you had cameras in the cockpit, they'd have to be everywhere because this was an, a rudder issue. So you'd have to have cam rudder, uh, cameras down on the rudder pedals, basically, to see what was going on. And then even still, if the rudder went in on its own, the rudder pedal's going to go in, and your foot, if it's on the rudder pedal, it's going to go in too. So I'm not sure that a camera would have necessarily helped to solve that one. We might have been able to see that the pilots were, were struggling on the, on the opposite rudder to correct the hard over. But, uh, so there's a case where cameras might have helped, but they may not have helped. On the other hand, we had Spaceship Two. Now this, of course, was a, a scale composites uh, uh, spaceship that crashed on, I think, Halloween of 2014. And of course, as with any test flight, it's got loads of telemetry data, including good, high fidelity um, video recordings, audio and video. And immediately, our investigative staff was able to say the co-pilot actuated a, move, a, a lever that caused this uncommanded deployment of the tail feathers. And so had we not had that, we would have spent years, probably like in TWA 800, probably like with US Air 427, looking for some sneak circuit or something. But instead, we knew immediately what had, had, had led to this mishap. And we were able to complete the investigation in nine months. So I've seen both sides of it. And, um, and so 
Um, basically, that's it. If I may add one more thing, and just to support <laughs> What uh, Robert is saying, um, the Icelandic Transportation Safety Board did an investigation following the crash of a Sukhoi jet in Iceland in, uh, that was under test. And it was, and they had image recorders on board because there was a lot of uh, testing going on as part of the aircraft certification. They, using the image recorders, the uh, investigators were actually to corroborate, able to corroborate the crew's testimony about what they had done uh, during the event which was not supported by the FDR. The FDR data didn't record the fact that the crew had actually activated the toga switch, but the, record, the image recorder showed that. So I agree, it, 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 you know, that it's not the total answer, but it can certainly supplement. And the other thing which we also uh, recognize is that it's very important to protect that information in the same way that we re protect other onboard recordings like CVRs. Absolutely, and, that, and that's, that's a very important point, uh, you know, trusting that data. We have seen in foreign investigations of voice recorder data being uh, released to media and to other entities, and, and, and that is a definite concern of those image recordings. Uh, you know, case in point, and, and great discussion, and, and I think that we've, we've spoken on this before behind closed doors to both agencies and, and told you our positions on it. And, you know, the, the, what comes to mind is, is, as we look back at some of these past accidents, and where we, we had only just maybe 35, 40 parameters on a flight data recorder. Uh, now we're recording hundreds of items of data off of those recorders right now. I think we know the lavatory level in the right lavatory in the back of the airplane now, even through that data. So uh, perhaps maybe image recording isn't the answer. Maybe it's more data points, perhaps rudder positions, uh, seat positioning, things like that. I mean, there's, there's enhancements there. And, and, and another point is, when we're looking at the, when we're talking about these image recorders, uh, you know, the fact that it's a regulatory issue. If it was to be regulated, it doesn't come through the investigative body. And, and we appreciate the fact that you want every tool to investigate. Mm -hmm. Don't want to tie your hands. But we, like you said, we agree to disagree on that, but that's a point to be made. And, and, and another point to it is also cameras that we would like to see on an airplane would be cameras that would be pointing at, say, wingtips, or perhaps maybe your landing gear to see if you're on the pavement. Uh, and on a security standpoint, maybe those cameras pointing to the back, towards the, the back of the cabin, those would be helpful. If the airline's gonna make that investment, that might be a good idea. And, and uh, you know, those are the types of cameras we'd like to see before we see the image recorders. But like, as you say, we agree to disagree, and I, and I appreciate you being candid on the, on the uh, topic. So moving on, let's go ahead and talk about proactive safety programs. So, so let, let oh, me back ahead. up to go that ahead. one. I'm sure. the one that didn't want to talk about this sure. topic, but, but I want to remind you that years ago, there were people and organizations that did not want focal programs. And can you imagine an airline today without a focal program? People thought, oh, this is going to be Big Brother spying on us. And how's it worked out? Worked out great. Worked out really well. Yes, it has. So we, our position at the NTSB, that any date, data like this should be for safety purposes and not for punitive purposes. And, uh, and, and so that's, I feel that way personally. And uh, I think that we can, we've made great strides over the last few years. And I think this is just uh, one extension of that. But I certainly understand the, uh, the concerns of, uh, of, of, of ALPA. Thank you very much. And, and if I may just add one more thing on, uh, because I think it's important for people to be aware of what's happening in Canada right now. The Minister of Transport has recently tabled legislation in the Canadian Parliament that will require the use of voice and video recorders in locomotive cabs, which is not currently required in Canada. Furthermore, um, because of changes to the Railway Safety Act and consequential changes to our legislation, uh, railway companies and the regulator would be able to use uh, those recordings for specific safety purposes and would be prohibited from using it for, for uh, punishment, if you will, uh, against the individual. And that would be safeguarded through the legislation as well as through the regulations. Now, that's only applicable to the railway uh, safety, in, uh, the railway uh, industry at this point in time. We will be removing from our legislation the, uh, the legislative barrier that precludes against the use of, of uh, recordings for other than um, uh, accident investigation purposes. But at this time, it's, it's, uh, the changes are, are confined to the railway industry. But it's something, I think, to watch going forward in terms of how that works out and, and what kind of additional data 
not only we get, but also uh, from the video recordings, but also what companies, how companies can use them for proactive, non-punitive safety management systems. Absolutely, and we're in agreement on that, that non-punitive is the, is the way to go, what, and with whatever data. As we yeah. see these aircraft that are bringing down data, like I say, and then there's also outside vendors that are asking for this data. Uh, we're, we're very staunch protectors of that data, and, I, and we believe you are too, to make sure that we're protected uh, with that data and it is de-identified. But in the exception of an accident or an incident, that, you know, again, mm -hmm. the, the words are non-punitive, and, and you've said them both, so yeah. much appreciated. Again, roles in proactive safety programs. Uh, you know, efforts to improving accident rates have changed in the last decade. And you spoke of it, Robert, the, uh, the FOCA programs and proactive safety programs were developed, and a high level of trust is placed in these programs throughout the industry. This has led to new opportunities to share experience and data. The NTSB historically has been more reactive, Robert. Releasing safety recommendations after accidents, while that is still extremely important, how does the NTSB envision participation in proactive safety programs such as ASIAS, and how would the NTSB utilize the information it receives? Great question. We certainly uh, support the proactive safety programs, uh, voluntarily voluntary sub submitted information. Really important. Again, I think that's one of the reasons that we've gotten to where we have in the uh, in the industry. Um, we, as far as ASIAS is concerned, we have a MOU with the ASIAS Executive Board, um, and and we've used that once on the uh, did not use it on the Asiana crash. We used it on another one uh, to look at at, uh, at 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 information. We don't get data from ASIAS. We don't get the raw data. Uh, so that's, we get a report from the ASIAS Executive Board. So, so we don't have the data. Um, I think that's one way that we protect it, is that we don't get it. Um, and so that's, uh, that's basically that. I mean, we, we encourage, we support FOCA programs, ASAP programs, uh, uh, LOSA programs. Um, so we're, we're in favor of these sorts of programs. Absolutely, and they are, as we've, we've proven, uh, industry-wide, uh, everyone's in agreement that Focal size has worked, and it's, uh, it's definitely good to see uh, support from the government agencies as well. Kathy, any comments on that, uh, safety programs, data programs? Uh, we don't receive, uh, outside of an occurrence investigation, we don't receive uh, specific data on a regular basis. Uh, some of the things that we're trying to do to be proactive, first of all, is, is publishing as much occurrence data as we can on our website. Uh, obviously, data that isn't protected or privileged, uh, so that others can have access to it and, and share it. Um, we also, uh, we've undertaken a number of safety studies, so we're not waiting for an occurrence. Uh, we, we've identified uh, issues. For example, we're doing one now. Uh, given the high rate of, of fatal accidents and fatalities in the air taxi industry, we're doing a, a broad safety issues investigation into that. Uh, we do have a confidential safety reporting program called Securitas, where any uh, employee uh, or any individual citizen uh, can, can file a confidential safety report with the Transportation Safety Board, and, and we'll follow up on, on that. Um, so we're, you know, I, I think it's very important to get information out to people, but uh, we don't collect the data ourselves except in the context of, of an investigation. As we start to talk about SMS and its development and how it's starting to evolve, Kathy, I have a question for you. What are the challenges with investigating operational factors in an investigation? So the, the Transportation Safety Board in any investigation, of course, we, look, we lay everything on the table, environmental, um, things like you know, crew uh, experience, training, et cetera. Um, but we also, and we have been looking at organizational issues for a number of years now, even before safety management systems were, were introduced in Canada. And, um, but when we look at a, at a company now, what we, or at an accident now, what we like to look at is what were the hazards that caused or contributed? And as you may be aware, we, we have multiple causal and contributory findings. So we look at what were the hazards that contributed to the accident or the occurrence? Were they known to the company? If they were known, um, what did the company do to mitigate the risk? If they didn't, if they didn't mitigate it, why not? And we also step back and look at what role the regulator had to play. Uh, for example, if, if uh, the regulator was aware that the company was struggling to effectively manage uh, its safety, the safety of its operations, then we want to understand why. And so we've done a number of investigations where we've looked at, and in fact, safety management and oversight is on our, on our watch list and has been for, for several years. Um, 
It's important, I think, we, what we want to see is that all commercial operators, whether they're required to have a, a formal SMS or not, effectively demonstrate that they can manage the safety of their operations, uh, demonstrate that whatever processes they have are effective, and that the regulator has to demonstrate that if a company is not capable of managing its safety, if it's not uh, compliant with regulations, then the, the regulator t steps in on a timely basis to take action to help the company come back into compliance or do something else. Um, and we have seen some positive uh, actions from, from Transport Canada in that regard. Robert, anything to add to that? No, not really. I think I, I certainly agree with Kathy, and your question was what challenges do we have to investigate operational issues? I don't think we have challenges uh, investigating operational issues. We can get that information um, without difficulty. What is the challenge are the issues that Kathy uh, was referring to is digging down and looking at those underlying issues, the things that may not necessarily be readily apparent. Uh, hey, we know that the crew took off without the, uh, without the flap set, and we know that the crew didn't use the checklist. So that's easy to identify. What's harder to identify is to drill down and to see that, hey, this was an organization that had a culture of widespread procedural noncompliance. So that, I think, is the real trick, is to try to look at those underlying issues. I've got a sign uh, in my office that says the identification of the human error should be the starting point of the investigation mm -hmm. and not the ending point. So that's mm -hmm. what I want to make sure our, our investigations are doing is, is just exactly like Kathy said, is looking at the regulatory oversight, looking at those organizational factors that could, that could have been influenced the crew's behavior. One of the things that we've identified, we, remember that in Canada, uh, safety management systems have been required for Part 705 scheduled carriers since 2005. It was a progressive implementation over several years. NAV Canada is required to have a safety management system as our uh, maintenance organizations that support scheduled carriers. So we have quite an experience to date uh, investigating. And what we're seeing is a range from those companies that have fairly robust, mature, uh, effective uh, processes in place. But we've also seen the operators who've implemented an SMS because they had to, but in fact, they didn't live it. Uh, it was a document on paper, but it wasn't something that the, the flight crews and the, the technicians and the maintenance engineers lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we've identified that kind of um, operator. We've also identified other operators that they're trying their, their hardest uh, but they, they're under-resourced, they don't have the expertise, they don't have the infrastructure to support it. And so that's why uh, we continue to push that. We believe SMS can be an effective tool for companies to manage safety, but we also believe that the uh, Transport Canada, as the regulator, has to have a balanced approach, recognizing that not all operators are going to be at the same point on that, that journey in terms of their own ability to effectively uh, identify and mitigate hazards. Appreciate the candid comments on that because it is true. There are some carriers there that you know say SMS, but do they act SMS, mm -hmm. and do they do they operate in that that uh, just culture? And and that's on both sides of the border. And, and we do appreciate the uh, the candid comments, and we do recognize that that could be a hurdle sometimes. But uh, I think we're slowly starting to see an industry acceptance of, of those practices. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about social media. It's a uh, pretty touchy subject if you followed uh, our, our uh, latest news cycle. Uh, you can find out a lot more about what agendas are based on what someone is tweeting out, uh, more than uh, if you were to go to an official website. Um, with that, we've seen social media explode. Just about everyone either has an account or has a smartphone or the ability to participate in that. How does your organization incorporate social media into your communication plan, both for advocacy and during investigations? Robert, I'll start with you, and this is for both of you. Great. We were, we were having a good discussion uh, yesterday about this very issue, is how do we get information out. One of our core values at the NTSB is transparency, and I believe that it's important um, to keep the general public and the media uh, informed of what's going on. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, when there is an event, the public needs to know. They want to know. And if, that, if we don't release that information, that void will be will be filled uh, from other sources. So, um, you know, there's a balance. Uh, I certainly heard in this room, uh, in this same forum, three years ago, well, it was four years ago, uh, some criticism about our tweeting after the Asiana crash. And I think we've certainly, certainly taken that into consideration, that there's too much and there's not enough. And finding that balance 
is, is a trick, but it's important that we find that balance. That it's, it's, it is very hard to find that medium and to find that point. You're absolutely right, Robert, on that. It's, it, and it goes for all organizations in today's modern economy, modern world, uh, where to balance the message and where to, you know, to, to squeeze out the, the misinformation that could be spread. Kathy? Uh, and I think that's very true. We, we use social media and in, in we, we use Twitter, uh, we use Flickr, we use Instagram. Uh, we use it primarily to get information out uh, and particularly uh, to correct misinformation that may be out there in the immediate aftermath uh, of an accident or occurrence. Uh, we also use it to monitor uh, what people are saying, what people are, are doing, and that allows us to target some of our messages, particularly uh, to the media. Uh, so we found it a very effective tool. Uh, we have about 20,000 Twitter followers, and uh, we, you know, we tweet a couple of times a day uh, on various things, and of course we, we react to situations that are happening in the public. So we found it a very effective way to communicate and get our message out, or at least monitor, uh, keep our ear to the ground in terms of what people are saying. Absolutely, and, and, and as we've seen in some recent accidents, such as uh, Bagram, mm. uh, 747, social media uh, has probably enhanced your investigation uh, just because people would rather stand and take pictures and video and then post it on their account than actually run and hide or take care of themselves. They would rather be on video making sure that the rest of the world sees it. And, I, and we've seen this time and time again. Uh, uh, reminds me of a, of a 767 that had uh, blown a tire and had uh, parts of the wing escape and uh, the video was taken in flight and tweeted down through the in-flight entertainment system a few years back. And that's out there, and, and that's helpful. I yeah. mean, that, that can be used and leveraged. We have absolutely gotten information, uh, photos, videos, and I misspoke earlier when I said Instagram, it was YouTube, but uh, we put a lot of our animations out on YouTube, which yes. is very helpful in explaining accidents. But definitely, we've, we've been the beneficiary, I, I don't know if you have, Robert, of, of photos and videos that have come in from the public, which have been helpful in, to the investigators. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that uh, we're going to have to work with, but uh, I, I see, I, I see some, some bright spots in the fact that social media is out there uh, from an investigative standpoint, being able to, you know, photos, issues. I mean, there's the one issue that we have, and I think we all, we both, all three of us share the complaint of when our passengers decide to evacuate an aircraft that they decide to start taking pictures of the aircraft. <laughs> Doesn't help. We don't need a picture that fast. But uh, in, in other cases uh, where folks have been on the airport perimeter and, and things like that, that can help us uh, in the long run. So as we look at threats to aviation safety and we look towards new technologies, including automation, Kathy, what do you perceive as the biggest threats to aviation safety in the upcoming years and how do we mitigate them? Uh, that's a difficult question for us to ask to some extent because we are, by our mandate, reactive. We react and, re and respond to occurrences. Um, so, but we're certainly uh, we're certainly watching what's happening in industry. So, uh, you know, in terms of some of the ongoing issues, whether it's the introduction of UAS into the commercial navigation air navigation system, whether it's fatigue and duty, uh, whether it's pilot recruitment and qualifications, I mean, we're we're aware of that. I was asked the question actually amongst a group of airport executives, and I think the biggest risk is trying to identify what your next biggest risk is. Um, there's still a lot of issues out there that we think are well known to the industry, unstable approaches that are continued to a landing, runway overruns, runway incursions, that a lot more could be done to resolve those known issues. But it will be a challenge. Uh, and and I, I heard somebody say at a conference, and I repeated it, it wasn't my quote, but uh, that you know, your accident, your next accident is in your data. So it's, the question is how do we mine that data and, and find those risks uh, that are emerging? Yes. Steve, um, just from my personal perspective, um, complacency. Complacency within the industry is something that, that worries me. You know, back uh, when we were having crashes all the time, people were in management, were, were aware of that. We had five hull losses, seven hull losses at, at my airline in a five-year period of time, five of which were fatal. And um, the management for the next few years was very aware of all of those things. But as time evolved, the people that were running the company weren't the same people that were there during those bad times. And we've had an excellent run of good, safe flights over the last number of years. And the people leading airlines, maybe the people in flight ops, uh, weren't around 
back in those dark days. So I worry about complacency within the industry overall. That that is a that is a great uh, great point. I mean, it, as you said, you know, the folks that some people have instilled some of these regulations and rules are are no longer with the business, and they need to evolve and they need to change. And I think that comes with SMS. You have to evaluate what you put into place, and so that that's uh, that that walks hand in hand. I think that's great, Robert. Thank you. Thoughts on automation? I know we we could we could fill up a, a two hour panel on automation, but as we see it in all modes of transportation, not just aviation. Uh, we're seeing self-driving cars, automated train vehicles. Thoughts on where are we going with this? Is this a hot-button topic for the uh, agency you represent, Robert? A absolutely, in, in all modes of transportation, actually. Uh, Kathy, uh, when we spoke uh, last week, she, she explained that TSB of Canada doesn't do surface, but we certainly do. We have autonomous vehicles that will be driving around, and uh, that's very much of a hot-button issue. In airplanes, uh, I think we've learned a lot. Uh, great researchers like uh, Sherry Chapel and others have done a lot over the years to, uh, to learn about the human-machine interface. Um, and, and so I'm not so worried about it necessarily in, uh, in aviation. I'm just hoping that some of those modes in aviation can actually be applied to the other modes that are, um, are trying to implement uh, automation. That, that's a great point. Uh, you know, we, we, we're being looked at for other things such as fatigue and, and risk management. Uh, a lot of other industries are looking towards the aviation business because airlines and air crews have been doing this for decades now. And uh, a lot of the work that you started up, Robert, is, is, can be attributed uh, to efforts you had is, is starting to work its way into the medical field. And so I agree. I think that this can be leveraged towards automation on our surface uh, transport as well. Some great thoughts there. Uh, if there's one thing you had the ability to change in regulations, and this, this may be an on-the-spot question, but if you had the ability to change something in regulation, culture, or SOPs, what would that be, Kathy? I think it takes too long to address known safety issues. Um, we actually have on our watch list an item uh, where we've um, identified the fact that the, the regulator in Canada has taken too long to address uh, our recommendations even when they agree with us, uh, with the recommendation. So uh, we believe that more needs to be done to expedite uh, safety-related uh, regulations uh, in order to fix these issues. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the board made a recommendation in 1995 for the implementation of GPWS, Ground Proximity Warning System. That was finally introduced in 2012 in Canada, 17 years later. By that time, the technology had changed. It was called TAWS. So that takes too long. Now, that being said, it, it's not that every safety issue needs to be ad addressed with a regulation. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But we know that to, you know, to have a level playing field for, in a very competitive industry, that sometimes it takes regulation to get everybody up to the same level. The proactive companies will go ahead and do it, but you know, others may, may lag behind waiting for that regulation to come in. So there's other things to do, and we also say that industry operators don't have to wait for the regulator to take action. They should be able to go ahead and, and take steps to reduce the risk in their operations. But that would be uh, on my wish list. Great. Robert, same question. Well, I do agree with Kathy that it takes uh, too long to, to enact regulations, and uh, I'm told that the, 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 the initiatives that the CAST has implemented, all of those things that the CAST has done over the years, not a single one of those things was done through a regulation. It was all done with the industry deciding that they needed to do something differently. And I got somebody to run a data run on this uh, just last week. About, only about 18, let's say 20 percent of our recommendations these days are actually calling for a regulation, require, have the FAA require that airlines do this or do that. Uh, the other 80 percent are work with your members to find a solution for X, Y, Z. So we are, we are really, uh, in many cases, focusing on, on that voluntary compliance. But I agree with Kathy that the regulation needs to set the floor. And there are some people that are bottom dwellers, and they're not going to necessarily come up to the regulatory, uh, up to the uh, voluntary compliance level. True point, and 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 all this takes collaboration to do it on the voluntary side, and and that uh, you know we see that uh, with the agency and also with the airline pilots association. We do appreciate your efforts to involve us in a lot of your 
in a lot of your outside of an investigation activity, such as your special investigation work. Uh, Robert, I participated in your PIREP forum last year, which you hosted excellent. Uh, those sort of outside events, bringing in stakeholders and industry people, I think is valuable to promote that voluntary uh, uh, work towards uh, you know, a safer system. How can organizations such as ALPA or other industry members help your agencies promote the safety message, Kathy? Well, I think it's, it's by um, supporting you know, and uh, recognizing that you're not going to agree with all the recommendations, as we've discussed with image recorders, but, but really emphasizing, I mean, ALPA has a significant um, influence, I think, and, and, a, and a voice in the aviation industry and can certainly, uh, I hope, um, support and, and reinforce and echo the messages uh, that we have with respect to, um, you know, increased training for, uh, you know, for pilots, uh, improved capacity for voice recorders, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think you can play a very active role in kind of supporting that and, and educating the public and the government, uh, the regulator uh, and, the, and the politicians in terms of the fact that these things need to get done. Yes. Keep doing what you're doing. I know that there's a lot of uh, pressure on costs these days. Uh, look what you're doing. You continue. What is this, the 63rd, if my math is right? This 63rd. is the 63rd yeah. Annual Air Safety Forum. Keep doing it. ALPA has always been at the forefront of doing these things. So keep it up. And thank you very, very much uh, for your, your, along the years, the collaboration we've had with both of your agencies. We do appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with you, and we hope to continue to keep working with you and, and you. be a trusted, uh, valued partner to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.